The Sixers suffered a game one defeat in Boston to the Celtics. We're going to be breaking down all the film right now. Joel Embiid looked terrible. James Harden looked good. And where the hell was Tyrese Maxey? Why were we not running actions for him? Why did the offense just look completely different than it looked in the preseason? All that stuff and more in the best place to get your Sixers film breakdowns, the Sixers break room. Let's get to it. What's up, YouTube, and welcome back to the Sixers break room. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel. I'm going to be bringing you guys these film breakdowns after every single game. I'm also going to be bringing you live streams at halftime of every game. I know a lot of people go live during the game. A lot of people go live after the game. I'm going to be bringing you live content at halftime. I am a basketball coach, so the whole halftime show is going to be about what I saw in the first half, ways that I feel like the Sixers need to make adjustments uh, based on what's going on in the game, offense defensively I did one last night people seem to dig it so we're gonna keep on doing those so make sure you're subscribed to the channel so that you don't miss any of those halftime live streams or any of these breakdowns now in game one against the Boston Celtics the Philadelphia 76ers overall it, it wasn't terrible like we didn't look terrible however Joel Embiid looked terrible James Harden looks to be a little bit more like the James Harden of old and I gotta be honest between what I saw offensively and the lack of movement and the lack of opportunities for for Tyrese Maxi to make an impact I'm a little surprised at some of the things that I saw let's take a look at this first clip here right like you're gonna have a Noah Vonley ball screen and Jalen Brown's gonna be coming off of this ball screen now Joel Embiid is playing drop coverage so here you have Joel Embiid he's playing drop which means he's sinking back He's, he's willing to give up a mid-range jumper from Jalen Brown. I'm not going to just let you shoot the ball, but I'm kind of trying to force you into a drive where I can use my length to contest at the basket, and you're going to have Tobias Harris go over the top of the screen. Well, part of the reason why I feel like Joel Embiid looked bad is, number one, there's no communication here. So T Tobias Harris doesn't even know the screen is coming. And then look at Joel Embiid's effort. I mean, not even for a second did it look like he wanted to contest this shot. James Harden, who's not even involved in the play or the action, did more of a job stunting at the ball than Joel Embiid did. This is just lazy defense. No communication, no effort. Let's take a look at this next clip here. Another Jalen Brown bucket. Jalen Brown here, pause. He's about to make a move and he's going to drive to the middle. Joel Embiid is just watching. Joel Embiid is guarding Al Horford here, who if he's going to, can he hit threes? Yeah, but are you overly concerned with him taking them? Not really. Joel Embiid needs to be sliding over in help to try to stop this penetration. Instead, once again, there's no effort. There's no attempt to even remotely stop in Jalen Brown, and we're just watching him get a bucket. And it wasn't even like it was just late in the game and he was tired. This is like the second possession of the game. We're a minute into the game. Take a look at Joel Embiid this whole possession, right? Chilling, chilling, stumbles over his feet a little bit. Okay, I get it. But watch from here. There's no effort. There's no effort to get back into the play. He knows he has to slide out and get ready to guard Jason Tatum. He's late, and look at the closeout. Hold on, y'all. Look at this closeout. Bro, he could have. He if he was speed walking, he would have been quicker to this closeout. Now it's early in the game. I know what you're thinking. Whatever, like it's an early shot. It's not that big of a deal. But this was kind of just like look inside of what was to come this game because the effort was this low throughout from Joel Embiid on the defensive end. Just another example here, right? Joel Embiid jogging back, jogging back. Oh, I'm not gonna contest this. I'm gonna just let him have this layup, like. And this is the second quarter. Now, again, I'm not trying to kill Joel Embiid in the sense of like saying he's not good. He's just very clearly not in shape. And I made a video a couple weeks ago after seeing that practice where I, I questioned whether or not he was in shape. And people were telling me it's just practice. Well, now it's not practice. Now these games count and he's not in shape. But personally, and this is the last clip that I'm going to to be talking about when it comes to Joel Embiid's defense. This is the one that drives me nuts the most. Let's let's first take a look at it with no commentary. Take a look at Joel Embiid on this play, who I'll circle him for you. He's right here. Just take a look at him on the, in the, the entirety of this play with no commentary. Joel Embiid doesn't even react until the ball is already inbounded. Now, pause here, because I know what some people are going to say. Some people will say, well, this is on Niang. Well, I'm going to tell you why it's not on Niang, okay? So you're having Grant Williams set the ball screen, or I'm sorry, the off-ball screen here, and you're going to just have a simple Malcolm Brogdon cut to the basket. I'm going to tell you why it's not the responsibility of George's Niang, George Niang, right? Because Niang is guarding a shooter. So Niang knows that he has to stick with the shooter here. He can't afford to overhelp on this cut because if he overhelps when Brogdon cuts, well, you're going to get a pop from Grant Williams, and then you have a very easy pass for a very easy three. So 
George Niang is he's not able to help. He he's letting him know now the screen's coming and he knows he cannot really help. So the responsibility comes from the weak side. The responsibility comes from Joel Embiid. Joel Embiid should not be glued to Al Horford here because Al Horford is not a threat on this inbound. Joel Embiid should be alert to what's going on, having his hands off of his hips, and Joel Embiid should be dropping into the middle, taking everything away. If he's going to throw this pass across the middle of the court to Al Horford from 17 feet, well, first of all, if Al Horford shoots it, whatever, you'll give up a mid-range jumper to Al Horford, number one. But number two, Embiid would have the ability, the athletic ability to close out at the free throw line and contest the shot. But again, he's just sleeping at the wheel, sleeping at the wheel. Look, he's like, oh crap, I messed up. And he knows, he knows he, you could tell by the body language. If he didn't think it was his responsibility, he wouldn't have reacted the way that he did. That right there tells you, damn, I messed up. And that was two points. Now let's talk about James Harden. Uh, we're going to talk about two things about James Harden. Number one, he finally looks like he got his lift back on his shot. Physically, he looks healthy and he looks in shape. I didn't love all the isolation buckets here. You get a ball screen from Harold to get the switch. And now I have a mismatch. I'm just going to break you down, hit you with a little bink, 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 step back, and I'm knocking down this shot. A lot of isolation from James Harden, but it's just the fact that he physically looks confident in this shot. Last year, he didn't look confident shooting these, and he seems like he's got that swagger back because he has that pop back. You can see here it was very clearly a priority to get, to get Grant Williams on James Harden. As soon as Harrell got in the game and Grant Williams was guarding him, it was pick and roll. Let's force a switch again. I don't know why they switched so, so quickly in the NBA. Like, this is not a great screen. He doesn't even set the screen. The Celtics have just decided beforehand we're going to switch. And I think a lot of it probably has to do with they trust Grant Williams in this situation. But, like, Marcus Smart doesn't have to switch this. He didn't really set a screen. Marcus Smart could have just pressed up, Grant Williams sink back, and you didn't get the switch. But they were clearly attacking Grant Williams once again. Bink, bink, bink. Step back, knock down, plus the foul. Here we go again. Isolation. You got James Harden on Al Horford. As you can see in a lot of these James Harden clips, there's not really much to break down because it was very much just letting James Harden do James Harden things. Little between the legs, step back, knock down, shooting with confidence. That's the key. He's shooting with confidence. You can see he's healthy again. He has lift on his jumper. This right here, these are the kind of things that I want to see from James Harden more and things that I like to see from James Harden when he doesn't just settle for the three. Take a look here. You're going to have this ball screen from Joel Embiid, who, as you can see, the Celtics decide they're not going to switch this one because they don't want Horford on Harden, right? So Jason Tatum actually works to get around it, but Joel Embiid does a great job of rescreening it. And you'll see here, take a look at Al Horford. He's in drop coverage. I mean, he's a good seven, eight feet away from James Harden here, and James Harden gets to attack downhill, and take a look what happens next. He gets to a spot. We call this putting him in jail. He puts James Hart, or I'm sorry, he puts Jason Tatum in jail with that little hesitation right there. It forces Tatum to hesitate because if, if Tatum keeps going forward, he's going to bump into Harden. Harden's going to throw his head back, and he's going to get the and one, right? So J Jason Tatum has to kind of hesitate with him there, and now it frees him up for the shot. It's also that quick little hesitation and change of pace playing with his eyes that messes with Horford. Take a look at the vision here. What do you think he's looking at? He's looking at Embiid, or he's selling the look to Embiid on the roll. This forces Al Horford to drop back, right? You see that little shift of weight? It was very subtle. It's very subtle, but look how Horford kind of shifts his weight, and now he has an open floater. Last clip I'm going to show of Harden here. This is what you love to see, man. This just told me everything that I needed to know about James Harden and his health and how he feels physically. Look at him. Bink, bink. I'm going by you. I'm not settling for the jumper, right? I'm able to size you up. I'm able to hit you with a couple moves and get to the basket and finish. Now, is he the James Harden of old? No, because that's probably a dunk in the past. Like, James Harden used to get to the Baja and slam on people. Here is a layup, but he's still, the fact that he's able to beat guys off the bounce like this and finish with that contact tells me he's back, he's healthy, and I can't wait to see more of him. Let's take a look at Tyrese Maxey. Let's break down some of this film in regards to, to, to Tyrese because I was shocked at how little they used Tyrese Maxey offensively, especially in the first half. I remember looking at the box score midway through the third quarter, and he only had eight shots. Eight shots through two and a half quarters. This is very early in the game. We're not even two minutes into the game, and this was one of the very few times. If you guys go back and watch, you'll see it's true. This is the very one of the very few times we actually ran an offensive set. We ran a lot of pick and roll. That That's not a set. That's just, that's just going out there and playing. We were pretty much playing pickup basketball all night long. But on this play, we actually tried to run a set. You're going to see we set up Joel Embiid at the high post. From here, you're going to get the pin down. You're going to get the pin down screen 
from Tucker into a dribble handoff with Tyreek Maxey. And I love this action. It's uh, 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 Most coaches call this Chicago action, a pin down with a dribble handoff. I talked about that a lot in my breakdowns last year. So you get this Chicago action, pin down into a handoff. Joel Embiid doesn't set a great screen, but Tyrese Maxey also doesn't do a great job of reading the situation. I think it's early in the game. Tyrese is trying to get to the basket, get an easy layup, so I respect it. But the kind of shooter he is, if a defender goes underneath the screen, as you'll see uh, Jason Tatum does here, you shoot this. You shoot this. And in the preseason, Maxi was shooting this. But I can kind of understand you're just trying to go get a bucket to, at the start of the game. So he gets downhill, gets blocked, whatever. I like the drive. But that was one of the few times he actually got a set to get a shot off. And this right here is why I'm not sure why he didn't just pull up when Tatum went under the screen. Take a look at this. You got a defender sinking on you. Look, just shooting with confidence. Knockdown. That's why I would have loved for him to shoot on that last clip. So in this clip here, we're on, I think, his fourth shot attempt. And we're in the second quarter, right? So he only took two maybe two shots in the first quarter, maybe three. I think his last shot was in the second quarter as well. But you get a ball screen for Tyrese Maxey. He's able to get to a spot, get Noah Vonley playing drop. He gets to a spot. He knocks it down. Again, I'm not sure why we weren't trying to get more looks for Tyrese Maxey. Look how easy. This is easy basketball. Ball screen, pull up from the elbow area, bang. It's easy. Why didn't we get him more looks? Here we go again, right? Because of Tyrese Maxey's ability to shoot off of screens and shoot from deep off of screens, take a look at what Marcus Smart's trying to do. Marcus Smart is trying to ice this ball screen. He's trying to ice the ball screen. What does that mean? Well, that means that the ball screen is coming here. Usually, when you're playing drop or hedge, the defender is actually playing to force you to use this ball screen. He wants you to use the ball screen because the help is going to be right here, either in drop or the hedge would be higher, but it's on the other side of that screen. When you're playing ice, he's trying to actually do the opposite. Now Marcus Smart is trying to force him to go this way. That's why he's positioned his body to reject the screen, and Noel Vonley is supposed to be down here. And Noel Vonley sliding over, but not quite as much as he needed to, and he doesn't keep containment. At this point, you have to keep Tyrese Maxey in front of you. You cannot bail too early. Also, not completely on Noah Vonley. Al Horford also needs to be sliding over on this drive. There is three in the key in the NBA, so he can't just sit there like you would in college or high school. But he does need to show. He's worried about P.J. Tucker in the corner, who's a shooter. So I understand why he's late. And then you get the layup. Tyrese Maxey just didn't get enough opportunity in the first half. This clip here, once again, more Chicago, except this time it's starting higher up. So before Embiid was catching it at the high post, here he's catching it way outside the three-point line, but it's the same principle. It's the same principle. You're going to get the pin down from P.J. Tucker. You're going to get the dribble handoff into Tyrese Maxey. Once again, Maxey does turn the corner, and he gets downhill, gets in the lane. This time finishes off the glass. And the last thing that I want to talk about, I know this video is already going pretty long. I don't want it to go much longer. I mean, there's so many things you could break down, man. I, I, I love this game so much. I love basketball. I love coaching it. I love teaching it. I could go on and on and on for hours with just this one game. But the last thing I want to talk about is Joel Embiid at the high post because it drew a lot of uh, criticism on social media. And I just want to explain why you put him at the high post. So let's like take a look at this clip here. Boom, you throw it into the high post of, for Joel Embiid. Now, the reason why you do this is because at the high post, it becomes extremely difficult to double team Joel Embiid. If Joel Embiid catches it at the block area, it's a lot easier to rotate and double and trap out of uh, out of the post touch. Also, you're adding an additional defender. So you'll often see traps coming to force a guy towards the, towards the sideline, depending on how the help defense is. But you'll often see a trap coming forcing him to the boundary because that becomes essentially a third defender because you can't go any further than that line. So by keeping a guy at the high post, well now, if somebody's going to double, you're, you're, it's, it's a much greater rotation. It's much more difficult to do. And you, in fact, you'll even notice when he was catching the ball at the high post, there weren't many double teams where, where he was getting himself in trouble was he was trying to drive and he was driving right into the help right? And that's because there was no movement from the other four. So in this clip here, you're going to see you get movement from the other four guys on the floor and it becomes impossible for them to double. You're going to have Tyrese Maxey at the top who gets an exchange, a little pin down for uh, for Daniel House and you get an exchange with Melton and Niang and then Niang also is going to set another pin down screen. So boom, you get the exchange between Maxey and House. Here you get the exchange with Niang and Melton. Then 
you get this pin down from Niang and the pin down. So here you go, the pin down from Niang, pin down from House with Maxi coming off, Melton coming off. All four defenders are occupied. Nobody can help. And that leaves Grant Williams on an island for Joel B to be able to just knock down an easy shot. No double team coming because it's impossible, not impossible, very difficult to, to trap when they're at the high post. Here's the other side of that. Now here you're going to get very little movement. Boom. Catch at the high post. Maxi, Harden. They're just watching. They're just watching. P Tobias Harris, he's just watching. You're not only guy that makes any kind of movement. Here is PJ Tucker. PJ Tucker is he sets a flare screen here, right? He sets this flare screen. That means he's setting a screen um, towards the middle of the floor, and Tobias Harris is popping out towards the wing or out towards the corner. However, Joel Embiid. He's just trying to do too much here. He tries to put the ball on the rack. Look at all the eyes he has on him up top. It's still not a double. He doesn't double, but if James Harden moves, if James Harden either cuts through, exchanges, or sets a pin down for Maxi, Jalen Brown's not able to sit here like this, right? If Tobias Harris and P.J. Tucker get this action going quicker, Marcus Smart's not able to sit there like this. So the difference between the last possession and this one, it's not that the high post was an issue. It was one possession, you had four guys moving. This possession, you had three of the four guys just watching. It results in a turnover. So obviously I couldn't cover everything from this game, but I definitely wanted to go over Joel Embiid looking terrible defensively. He's very clearly out of shape. I wanted to talk about James Harden looking like he's in great shape and playing a really good game. Tyrese Maxey needs to get more touches in the first half when they ran some actions for him. You saw that Chicago action. He was able to get in the lane twice, playing in the ball screen. He knocked down one from the elbow, had a baseline drive for a layup. But to only have eight shots through two and a half quarters, especially after the preseason he had, I was very surprised. And expect a whole lot more of Joel Embiid at the high post. One, because he's capable, but two, it makes it a lot harder for the defense to be able to double team him. I think when he's in better shape and able to attack better from that position, as well as getting all the other guys on the same page and knowing what to do when he catches it there, it's going to look a lot better. Sound off in the comment section below. What did you guys think of game one? What do you think was the biggest reason why the Sixers didn't get the job done last night? Sound off in the comment section below, man. I want to hear from you guys. I don't think this guy is falling. This team is going to be okay. We spent all offseason talking about championship robust. We can't all all of a sudden be angry or worried about this team after just one game. It's not about October. It's about what it looks like in April, May, and June. If you like the video, don't forget to like the video. Subscribe to the channel. And if you want to become a member, that link is in the description below. I'm going to be announcing some exclusive content to members only soon. So you want to make sure you're a member for that. And I'm going to see you guys on the next one. This is the Sixers Break Room. Peace.